weeks ago entitled The Purpose of Christmas. I know if you've been out and about, you realize that it's everywhere. It's in the malls, in the grocery stores, maybe even in the office where you work. I call it the song of Christmas or the song of the Christmas season, the Christmas music. Now, Christmas is the only time of the year when everyone seems to be humming the same song or else one similar that you can't get out of your head. How many of you know what I'm talking about? How about this one, Silent Night? Or this one we just heard sung, which I thought Steve did a fabulous job. Mary, did you know? Or how about this one? I know a few people that just absolutely love this song and it gets in their head, Feliz Navidad. How many of you know they sing Feliz Navidad a lot? That brother, I thought about him this morning. I thought, he, hopefully he made a lot of money off that song because they sure do sing it a lot. Now I want you to remember this, that most of the accounts that talk about his birth, talking about the birth of Jesus, it involves worship. Now my entire purpose Uh, in sharing these messages with you is to stir your heart once again regarding worship. How many of you know that's, I've, I've talked about it in this series, it's one of our primary purposes in life, it's to be a worshiper of God and everything else we do in life flows out of that. So that's been one of the purposes, but also to remind each of us of the true meaning of Christmas. It's His presence. Not the gifts that we get from Him, but His presence that is with us. Emmanuel, God is with us. Now these last few weeks, we've read the account of the Magi or the wise men in Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. It says they saw His star. And what did they do? It says they went to worship Him. And then last week, we read the account of the shepherds and the angels in Luke chapter 2. I love Luke's version of the birth of Christ. Now this morning... As Christmas is drawing closer, we're going to read the account of Mary as she goes to visit Elizabeth, and we'll read the account that's often referred to as Mary's song. I want you to see the theme of Christmas, and and obviously it's the birth of Christ, our Savior, but there is a theme that runs all the way through it, and it is that of worship. Luke chapter 1. I'm going to begin in verse 31. While you're turning there or getting your device out, Luke chapter 1, verse 39, I'm going to pray for us. Father, thank you so much for this season, this Christmas season. Lord, I'm really enjoying the way this has come this year. Lord, we could be together on Christmas Eve and celebrate your coming. Father, I want to just thank you this morning that, that Lord, you came. And yes, we want to worship you with all of our hearts, but Father, I want to thank you this morning that Jesus didn't remain a baby. That he grew up and he became a man. And Lord, thank you that he came and he went to the cross and he died. And He, uh, Lord, in in his death, he bore our sins and our sicknesses, our diseases on his body. And then, Lord, he conquered our enemy, the devil. He conquered the grave and then he resurrected uh, to heaven, Lord, where he is seated right now. At the right hand of your throne, Lord, making intercession for us. But Lord, we thank you it doesn't end there. Thank you that the Christ, Jesus Christ, is coming back again one day to rule and reign on this earth. Father, we thank you for this season and what it means. And we give you praise for the totality of Christ's birth in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 39, it says, A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea. To the town where Zechariah lived, she entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her. That's interesting to me. Here's another interesting statement. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 42, Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women And your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? Let me just stop and say all young women in Israel at this time understood that they could be the benefactor of this visitation from the angel. And they could be the one who bore the Christ child. And so Elizabeth is expressing this great honor that uh, Mary had come to see her. 
Let me read it again, verse 42. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. Think about that. Verse 45, you are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. And then Mary responds in verse 46. It says this, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and the haughty ones. He has brought down the princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. Verse 53, he, was, he has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then went back to her own home. Now, I want to just take a few moments today and talk to you about the heart of worship. Now again, I know I've already said this, that's what this entire series is about, is to stir up the heart of worship in each and every one of us. Romans Chapter 3, verse 13 says, Give yourselves to God, surrender your whole being to Him, to be used for righteous purposes. How many of you know until you surrender to the Lord, you can't really serve fully His purposes? Now, I want you to think about this. The heart of worship is surrender. The heart of worship is surrender. And how many of you know that is the struggle with mankind? That's the reason many people do not come and serve the Lord because they still want to hold on to who they are, their, their own rights, their own will and purpose. How many of you know that surrender is an unpopular word? It, it is. It's disliked almost as much as the word submission. Gentlemen, don't ever use the word submit to me uh, in your household because it doesn't go over very well today, though it is a biblical word. This word surrender, it implies losing, and no one wants to be a loser. I don't want to be a loser. How about you? We have some dear friends who are in this room today, and we get together, and we play a card game called hand and foot. And the men play against the girls, or the girls play against the guys. I, I don't know how you want to think about that. But I know one thing. We men do not like to lose. But the reality is we do lose frequently. But equally, our lady friends do not like to lose either. It goes both ways. How many of you know surrender evokes the unpleasant images of admitting defeat in battle or forfeiting a game or yielding to a stronger opponent? The word is almost always used in a negative context. Or ne negative context. Here, here, here's an example. Captured criminals surrender to authorities. So how many of you get the image there? Also in today's competitive culture, we're taught to never give up and to never give in. You know why? Because we're good Americans. We're, this is bred in us. So we don't hear much about surrendering. If winning is everything, surrendering is unthinkable. However, surrendering to God, listen now again, I'll say it again, is the heart of worship. If you really want to know God's best for your life, if you really want to have a fulfilled life, and I know, I know that gets lost in people's minds, you must surrender to God, which really is the heart of worship. Now, if you think about it, worship is the natural response to God's amazing love and mercy. Once you come to know God's love and mercy, surrendering to Him comes a very natural uh, we give ourselves to Him, not out of fear or out of duty, but in love. Why? Because the Bible says that He first loved us. You know, when I'm in my prayer time with the Lord and I'm, I'm fellowshipping with Him, 
I always come to that moment where I tell him I love him, but I, I, I realize as I'm saying that, and I tell him this, but you love me first, so I really can't take much credit, but I just want you to know, Father, that I love you, and I thank you for first loving me. How many of you understand that? Romans 12 and 1 says, So then, my friends, because of God's great mercy to us, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God. How many of you know God doesn't want a dead sacrifice? It goes on to say, dedicated to His service and pleasing to Him. This is the true worship that you should offer. Once you understand God's love, once you understand His mercy, this is what we should offer to Him. True worship happens when you and I give ourselves completely to God. Now, I've talked about it in this series. Thank God, I love the corporate worship where we come together. There is something that is released in the corporate worship and the setting when we come together that is released no other way, no other time. I'm thankful for that. But how many of you know worship is far more than that? I've said that numerous times in this series. But when we give ourselves completely to Him, what happens? We experience His presence, the presence of God. In a few weeks, I'm going to be teaching you how to spend quality time with the Lord. How, how to pray. You do not want to miss this series. You may think, oh, that sounds kind of boring, praying to God. No, when you hear what, I'm going to, what, I, what I've learned about prayer, I'm going to teach you how to get into God's presence. How to be under God's directive every moment of your life. How to be under His blessing. How to be under His provision. How to enjoy His grace and His mercy 24, day, uh, 24 hours a day. Now, I want you to notice in this verse that I just read, the first and the last words of that verse are the same. You know what it is? Offer. We have to make a choice. Are we going to offer ourselves to God? It's a choice. I get to choose. You see, offering yourself to God is what worship is all about. And I think it delights the heart of God. In fact, I know it delights the heart of God when His children say, I'm just going to be a worshiper. Now, I know this is new to some of you. I know some of you are not accustomed to worshiping the Lord and some of this singing out loud. Don't worry about it. It's, it's a joyful noise to the Lord. Or not noise, but a joyful sound. God enjoys it. Don't be intimidated when, when we join in together and sing. And you know what? You may want to say, I hear Tracy all the time singing uh, in our house. I'll be somewhere else. I'll be in my little area where I do all my studying and caveman things. My cave whatever you call it, man cave. And I'll come stumbling in where Tracy said, I'll hear her just singing away, just, just singing. And, and she started talking to herself too lately. And I said, baby, you need to watch that. The singing's good, but the talking to yourself, I don't know about that yet. She says, oh, hush up. How I many you know it's a good thing to sing to the Lord? How I many you know it's a good thing to talk to the Lord? Now, there are some barriers that block our total surrender to God. Let me, let me tell you, these are very real. Here they are, number one, fear, and number two, pride. Let's talk about these two barriers that block our total surrender to God. Because I can tell you, uh, most of the struggle that people have, it boils down to these two barriers. I can tell you, I know people, it's the reason many people never fully come to the Lord and fully surrender their lives. Barrier number one is fear. In other words, can I trust God? Now, a lot of people don't trust God because they've never been able to trust anyone else. They've been used and abused by family members, maybe a mother or a father, and they have a trust issue. But trust is an essential ingredient to surrender. You won't surrender to God unless you trust Him. But you can't trust Him until you know Him better. Now, listen, I'm very fortunate. God came into my life when I was 20 years old, which... Then it seemed like I'd lived a lifetime in those 20 years. And I've had the privilege of walking with God, not perfectly, not, not all the time doing everything right. By no means, I want you to know that. But I'm in my prayer time Saturday morning, and I have certain things I do Saturday morning in preparation to come to church and, and preparing, uh, doing some last preparations on my message. And I'm telling you, God spoke to me yesterday morning and said, Do you know me? Do you know me? You, you pray to me, but do you know me? Now, I knew God was doing something different. Yes, I know God. 
But I knew God wanted me to know Him better, that there were some aspects of Him that I did not yet know. And two hours later, I had 45 pages of notes. It was a God thing. It was one of those moments where God wants me to know. Now, I'm not completely fleshed that out, but I can tell you it's going to be a message one day entitled, Who is God? You know, a lot of people have an image of who God is. I, I know I'm thinking of a particular individual. They'll tell me. I, I, I've been trying to love them for several years and encourage them. And they'll tell me, oh yeah, I believe in God, but not the way you do. Well, that's okay. You believe in God the way you want to, as long as it's biblical. As long as it's the biblical God. You know, and there are a lot of little g gods out there. And people kind of like to form their own God. But I'm going to be sharing that message with you sometime in the future. But how many of you know that fear keeps us from surrendering? Fear. Sometimes we don't even analyze. Sometimes we don't realize it. But the Bible says, but love casts out all fear. The love of God, if you'll allow God to love you and encourage you, will cast out all fear in your life. You see, the more you realize how much God loves you, the easier surrender becomes. How do you know that God loves you? How do we know this? Well, God gives us many, many evidences. And by the way, those of you who are doing the screen and stuff, I'm not going to read all of these, but, but here's one. Uh, Psalm 139, uh, it indicates to us you're never out of His sight. Here's what it says, Psalm 139, verse 3. It says, you comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Some of you, when you go through a bad day, you're wondering, is God with you? Is God aware of what you're going through? Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's family. And, and you know, a lot of people go through that this time of year. You know, families, uh, we can just get all scrambled up this time of year. And it, and it stirs emotions. You're wondering, God, where are you at? God's, God's with you. And God is aware of everything you are going through right now. Your emotions may not indicate that. They usually don't. Here's another one, Matthew chapter 10, verse 30. Did you know that God cares about every detail of your life? Now, you can argue with God and you can get mad at God, but don't do that. That's not the good approach. Because it says in this verse, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Now, listen, a God who can number just one individual's hair on the top of their head, that's a God that's in, in, in the details. Now, don't ever let this voice in you say, well, God's too busy managing the world and managing the universe that He doesn't have time for me. Oh, yes, He does. Did you know there are almost 8 billion of us now and God has the hairs on the head of every individual. Now, all of you in this room, that, that's, that's, that's a lot. More for some of you than others, but that's a lot. There's 8 billion of us. And God, God knows, knows about it all. Did you know, I'm not going to read this one, 1 uh, Timothy 6, 17 says that God has given you the capacity to enjoy all kinds of pleasures. Here's another one. I'm going to read this one. God has a plan for your life. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Some of you know this. A lot of you know it. Uh, it says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you. God's thinking about you today. And it's not bad thoughts. It's not negative thoughts. He says... The Lord says, I have thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. We should not worry about the future. Prayerfully, yes, approach it. Think about it. But no, we shouldn't be afraid of the future. I mean, you know, he forgives us. Psalm 80, 86 verse 5 says, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call on your name. God's ready to forgive. Have you done something that your heart now tells you uh, after the fact, I shouldn't have done that? I've done things like that before. And your heart grieves you. Why don't you ask God to forgive you instead of hiding? What we tend to do as human beings, we tend to do like Adam and Eve, is go and hide and hide and hide until we think God's forgotten it. Why don't you just, instead of hiding, just say, okay, I blew it, Lord. Here's what I did. Name it and list it. How, how about that? How many of you know, I'm not going to read this one. Uh, well, I'll, I guess I will. How many of you know God is loving and He's patient with you? See, some of you think God is impatient. Psalms 145 verse 8 says, The Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, and great in mercy. See, God loves you infinitely more than you can imagine. 
And you need to know this if you are going to trust Him. So the greatest expression of this that indicates that God loves us is the sacrifice of God's Son for us. And are we not reminded of that this time of year? God gave, the Bible says, His one and only Son. Here's, here's a verse, Romans 5 and 8 says, God proves His love for us, and, and while we were still uh, we were sinners, Christ died for us. When I was going astray and doing my own thing, not acknowledging God, making fun of Christians, making fun of preachers, I used to do that. I'd get up on Sunday morning all hungover, and I'd, I'd turn on the TV. It, it, then you only had about three channels where we lived. And we had the antenna. We did not have the electric when you had to go out and rotate it. And all you could get, that's all that was on on Sunday morning on our channels. And I would look at those preachers. And I was trying to find some relief and something. And I'd look and i think, man, that guy is a nerd. I, I, I can't imagine ever being one of those guys and doing what that guy does. That, that, that was an inside joke, folks. Beloved, I, I know this sounds like words to us sometimes, but you can trust God with every detail of your life. Here's the second bear, and this is a big one. It's called pride. In other words, admitting our limitations. A second barrier to total surrender is our pride. Everybody look at me and say, wow. Here's our problem as humans. Now, Probably for most of you here, you don't, you don't deal with this to the degree, but may, maybe you're about to be with some relatives and some friends, and they, they, they let you know, no, don't, don't, no, we're coming over, but don't give me any of that God stuff. How I many you know you don't have to give it to them? Just, just give them the look and smile and serve them. And, and, but, but, you know, usually at the root of that, just don't give me any of that God stuff. If it's not fear, it's usually pride. Did you know that? It is. Because we don't want to admit that, that we're just creatures and that we're not in charge of everything. How I many you know, according to Genesis, this is the oldest temptation in mankind. What did the devil say to Adam and Eve when he came to them? What did he say? He said, here, eat this. God's, God's holding out on you. God's holding out on you. He knows that if you eat this fruit, you're, it, basically what he was saying, you're going to be better off. You're going to be a much more enlightened individual. In other words, but, uh, but he didn't tell them the whole truth. And that's still what he does to us. Things we know we shouldn't partake of, things we know we shouldn't allow in our lives. Um, hey, maybe we're working on some of those things. But, but, but the devil convinces us somewhere, you're really better off with this than without it. And how many times do we, we fall for it once, we fall for it again, we fall for it again, and every time, we're kind of schizophrenic. We go in and out. God forgives me, God loves me, no he doesn't, God's mad at me. I mean, that, that's no way to live. A.W. Tozier said, the reason why many are still troubled, still seeking, still making little forward progress is because they haven't yet come to the end of themselves. It just keeps coming to my heart. Some of you have relatives and you're so burdened for them. And I, I get that. You want them to come to faith in Christ, but they won't do it. Well, they will one day because they at some point will come to the end of themselves, and that's when you need to be there. You need to keep some relationship going with them. Don't count them off. Don't give up on them. Because the day is going to come when they come to the end of themselves, and guess who they're going to call first? They'll have lost all their friends. They're like the prodigal. They'll lost everybody, and everybody will have given up on them. But guess who needs to be there? Mom and dad will probably be there. And that doesn't mean you have to be there and support them and, and give away your retirement to them and all those other things. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about loving them and encouraging them. Anybody in this room and, and listening know what I'm talking about. You want them to come to faith, but the, people don't do that until they come to the end of themselves. Beloved, we aren't God and we never will be. We are humans. We are humans. I know the vast majority of you listening to me know that. But I want you to listen very carefully. It's when we try to be God that we end up most like Satan. Who desired the same thing. How many of you know this battle that we see? Just, just look around in America. It appears to be political. It, it appears to be Republican. It appears to be Democrat. Independent. This philosophy. No, 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 no. It, it's really a, a battle 
with evil about who's going to get the worship. Satan still believes that he might can win this thing and end up getting the worship of man. And he's going to be trying to do that to the very moment when Jesus Christ comes back to this earth to establish his earthly kingdom. And he's going to put him in his place. Aren't you glad about that? Yeah, amen. I, I read about it again. He's going to be chained forever in the lake of fire where he belongs. And by the way, God, some people say, God, a loving God would never send anybody to hell. You are so right. God doesn't send anybody to hell. The Bible says hell was created for the devil and his fallen uh, disobedient angels. And the only reason any human being will go there is because they choose to follow Satan, his philosophies, and his ways, and because they reject Jesus Christ. That is the only reason. So you are right. Give yourself a hand clap. God doesn't send anyone there. We do it as individuals. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be most like Satan. Let me, let me just for a moment share with you the blessing of surrender. Now, the Bible is crystal clear about how you and I benefit when we fully surrender our lives to God. First, we experience peace. I think a lot of people are singing about peace and talking about peace right now. How many of you know, how many of you know in Christ, when we're surrendered, you can have peace in your heart? Doesn't mean everything is perfect around you, but you can be at peace. Job 22 and 21 says, stop quarreling with God. That's some good advice. If you agree with Him, you will have peace at last, and all things will go well for you. How many of you know the Bible talks about quarreling or arguing with God? It, it's, it's a waste of time. You can waste your life arguing with God. Second, you experience freedom. I love this one. Romans 6, 17 from the message says, Offer yourself to the ways of God, and the freedom never quits. His command set you free to live openly in freedom. I don't know about you, but I like freedom. And I'm not just talking about American freedom. I'm talking about spiritual freedom. The Bible says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. See, inside you is the Spirit of God if you're born again. And, and in that Holy Spirit, you have freedom. Thirdly, you experience God's power in your life. And I like this one because it's God's power that helps us overcome stubborn temptations. I would think some of you still deal with stubborn temptations. I know that feeling. I've known that before. But I've also known the power of God and know the power of God that has helped me overcome some very stubborn temptations throughout my life. And they're not all bad. By the way, say, what, what is the pastor tempted by? Probably the same things you're tempted by. Right? No, we're not going any further with that. How I many of you know those stubborn temptations are defeated by Christ when He gave His life? Here, here, here's, here's what we mean when we say surrender. We just heard it sung. God chose Mary to be the mother of Jesus. Not because she was talented or wealthy or beautiful, but because she was totally surrendered to Him. When the angel came, when the angel Gabriel came to her and spoke to her, she said, Be it according to your will. Now, estimates tell us Mary was anywhere from 14 to 16 years old. 14 to 16 year old young girl Gabriel comes to her and says, hey, God wants to give you something special. She wants, he wants you to carry the Son of God in your womb. Are you, are you willing, Mary? I, I, I'm willing. And by the way, how many of you know her and Joseph were not married at that time? Talking about a scandal and some problems that come with that. But when the angel explained God's implorable plan, she calmly responded in Luke chapter 1, verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, and I am willing to accept whatever He wants. Now, I'm not going to spend a long time. I'm almost finished with this message. But folks, maybe there's some of you that you feel like God wants you to do something. And maybe you're, you, you keep saying, well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe next year. Maybe, maybe some other time. And God is saying, no, now's the time. Now is the time. And you, it starts a process where you say, Lord... Not my will, but your will be done. Lord, if that's what you want, then that's what I want. How many of you know that nothing, absolutely nothing, is more powerful 
than a surrendered life in the hands of God. Now just a little bit more. Let me say this. Surrendering to God is the best way to live. Here, here, here's, here's what I've learned. Everybody eventually surrenders to something or someone. You've heard me say that when I talk about worship. Uh, a lot of people say, no, I'm, I'm neutral. I'm not a worshiper. No, 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 no. That's, that's not what, what, what uh, science tells us. And see, if it's not to God, you will surrender to the opinions or expectations of others. You know, some people live according to the expectations of others. They're, they're, they're always trying to please others instead of please God. Hey, you might even surrender to money or resentment. You know, there are some very resentful people today. How about to fear or to your own pride or lust or ego? I've stated it in this series, but I, I want you to get it. You are designed to worship God. Every one of you, when God created you, though we're dealing with our fallen nature and this fallen world, here's the reality. You were designed to worship God, and if we fail to worship Him, you will create other things or idols to give yourself in life. That's just the truth. Here's an important truth. You are free to choose what you surrender to, but you are not free from the consequences of that choice. God gave us free choice. That's the reason Adam and Eve were able to do what they did. Because they had a free will. They made a free will choice. They knew better. Adam knew better. God told Adam, Adam, in the day you eat of this fruit, you're going to die. We hope he told Eve. And guess what? They died. Romans 12 and 1 calls surrender your reasonable service. It's the most reasonable thing in light of what God has done for us to, to surrender to Him. Romans 12 and 1 from the contemporary English version. It says it's the most sensible way to serve God. It's sensible. It's reasonable. Beloved, you and I cannot fulfill God's plan or His purposes for our lives while we are focusing on our own plans. Now remember this. Surrendering is never just a one-time event. Thanks, Pastor. It's never a one-time event. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 15 and 51. He said, I die how often? Daily. So he said, well, thank you, Pastor. I was feeling pretty good about this. I was feeling good about my relationship. And so now you're telling me that I've got to die daily. That's exactly what I'm telling you. If you are not a believer in Christ, let me just tell you, uh, you're going to have some challenges there, and, and, and you're going to have to learn what it means to die daily. But it's worth it. Trust me. But there's a problem with these living sacrifices that Roman talks about. That you, you do get the picture that God doesn't want a dead sacrifice. Some of you say, well, when I die, then, you know, hey, I'm going to serve God. No, God doesn't want then. He wants it now. He needs it now. The problem with the living sacrifice is that it can crawl off the altar. Yeah, any of you ever crawled off the altar? Don't admit to it. Any of you ever, I, I guess we could say it the other way, you ever fallen off the wagon? Oh, that was bad. So guess what? You may have to re-surrender your life many times. In a day. Jesus said it this way in Luke chapter 9 verse 23. He said, if people want to follow me, they must give up the things they want. They must be willing to give up their lives daily to follow me. And I can just tell you from my own experience, it is worth it, my friends. When you hear a preacher or you hear someone say, God really does have a great plan for your life, it is true. It may take you a, a little while to discover what that is. It may take you time to develop that and fully understand that. But he really does. If I had time, I would go into some other areas of this in my own life. But one thing, let me, let me just say that I was talking to one of my grandsons the other day. And he was showing me his grades. I thought, well, he didn't get that from me. And I was kidding his father. I said, he must have got that from his mother. We were joking about it, but I told him, I said, listen, I never dreamed in my wildest dreams that I would ever need English. I wished I had paid attention 
when my teachers were teaching English. In my mind, I thought, hey, I'm East Texan. We got it all figured out. We have our own language, our own lingo. I don't need English. Well, I'm telling you what, I, I, I need English now. I need to know what verbs and adjectives and nouns are. And I won't go into detail why that's so important other than it pays when you're writing things. How many of you know what I'm talking about? God knows what He's talking about. Now, I'm going to warn you again. When you decide to live a totally surrendered life, that decision will be tested. Maybe there's someone within the sound of my voice today. Maybe you're online. Maybe you're seeing this. It's going to be tested. The Bible says Satan comes to, to remove the seed that God sows in your heart. But even in that, let me just tell you, surrendered is the only way to live. And I want to encourage you in this season, this Christmas, be like Mary... Be willing to accept whatever He wants and you will experience His presence. His presence. Maybe you'll be receiving some, quote, gifts, presents. But what we all really need right now, what our world needs, what our community needs, what America needs is the presence of God. And I've got some series coming up that are going to help us in that area. But let me close by saying this, and this is very important. I would ask, unless it's an emergency, nobody moving around, please. See, the greatest gift that God would like to give you today is His salvation. That's what God would like to give you. And, and when you're ready for that, all you really have to do is believe and confess Jesus Christ as Lord. But I heard this, Trace and I were listening to a program when we were coming home the other day from Greenville one evening, uh, listening to some Christmas music. I think we were listening to Phil Wickham. And he read these verses, and I thought, boy, that's true. And he said, to me, these verses summarize the Christmas story. And they summarize them for me. And boy, I thought something resonated with inside of me. Here it is, John chapter 3. Verses 16 through 17, it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. His only Son. God gave His only Son. That whoever, that includes you, whoever, doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The truth of the Bible is that if, when we don't receive Christ, one day we will perish. We will go to that place we don't want to go to. And it's real. But if we believe on God, we will not perish, but we will enjoy everlasting life. He goes on to say, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Here's what I want you to know as we're preparing to leave today. God gave His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, To become your Savior. And He died for you. We can't just stop with the baby in the manger. That's where a lot of people stop this time of year. The baby in the manger and Santa Claus. No, we can't stop there. You've got to go to His death, burial, and resurrection. Because He could not have died for us had He not been born. It's a great thing to celebrate His birth. But it's a greater thing to celebrate His victory over death and the grave. And all those things. But I want you to know this today. I don't care who you are, where you're at in your relationship with God. God is not condemning you today. God is not mad at you. God's Son, Jesus Christ, according to Isaiah 53, He bore everything that you and I would ever do. Every sin, every disease, every problem we would have. Jesus Christ took it on His body. Don't just stop with His salvation. Let God give you His purpose. God saves you, not, not only for heaven, but God saves you for a purpose. And those stripes on His back represent uh, the disease. It says, by His stripes you are healed. Why not this Christmas Eve receive health and healing today? Let's believe God for it. But if you do not know Jesus Christ, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And I'm going to ask everyone 
uh, who can to rise. And let's just pray together this morning. You pray out loud. Maybe there's someone near you. Maybe someone needs to pray this prayer. But if you want this to be the day that you come to the Lord God, your Heavenly Father who created you, has a purpose for your life, and you want Jesus to come into your heart and become your Savior, you want your sins forgiven, you want them washed away in God's sea of forgiveness, then you pray this prayer with me. It's a simple prayer. Just say, Dear God, I come in Jesus' name. I admit I've sinned. I admit I've done my own thing. I've gone my own way. But today I want to make that right. Today, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart, forgive my sins, and be my Lord and my Savior from this day forward. Give me the Holy Spirit without measure, and I will follow you from this day forward. In Jesus' name. Now let me just say, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, or you've been seeking out God's plan for your life, or maybe you're seeing this online, I want to encourage you to get our Next Step booklet. We keep these little booklets at every foyer. Uh, you can get them in the cafe area. You can get them in our foyers, all of our exit doors. There should be these little Next Step booklets there. First of all, it tells you again, maybe you weren't clear on everything, the first few pages tell you how to receive Christ, how to come to Him, how to be saved, and then it tells you what to do next. How many of you know the next thing you do is you need to receive water, baptiz water baptism? If you have never been water baptized, but you have followed Christ, you need to be water baptized. That is the next step of obedience. And then other things. You need to get in a good church. Get in a church that's preaching the gospel. Get in a church that steps on your toes every now and then. Y'all say amen. And start reading your Bible. If you need a Bible, we've got New Believer Bibles. We'll give you one. We'll help you every way we can. For those of you watching online, you want to learn a little more about your relationship with God, go to cotrquitman.com. It stands for Church on the Rock, Quitman. Dot com and go to the Meet God tab and there's just all kinds of information there. Contact us. We'll try to help you any way we can. We'll get you one of these little next step books. But it's all there. There's great information. But be sure and let us know what God has done in your life. Amen, everybody. Well, let me just say this. We're now, I'm going to ask my little wife to grab my candles. Or Steve, you want to grab those for me? Oh, he's... I get the big candle. If you did not get a candle this morning when you came in, thank you, Steve, you're a good servant of the Lord. If you didn't raise your hand, and we've got some men that um, are going to get you one. Anyone? All right. So I'm going to ask someone to dim the lights now. And I don't know how you think about A candle lighting service. But in my heart and mind, I like to envision Mary and the Holy Spirit overshadowing her. It says, the angel came and said, the Lord is going to overshadow you. And he's going to cause the Son of God to be birthed in you. And so I'm going to light this first candle, which represents Mary and the Son of God being conceived in her. And then I'm going to ask a couple of you just to step forward, and then you're going to take it to your areas, and we're going to light these candles in Jesus' name. Are you ready? Just let's go back about 2,000 years ago. The Holy Spirit came, and He empowered Mary to conceive the child, Jesus Christ, in her womb. Aren't you glad Mary said, Your will be done, Father, not mine. We wouldn't be here today if she hadn't said yes. How many of you just want to say yes to God's will today? Lord, we say yes to your will. Whatever you have for us, whatever you have planned, in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask some of you to step forward now. Come, Steve, and...
We're going to light these candles. And we're going to go around in what I like to envision. And this is how the gospel began to spread. Jesus chose his disciples, Peter, James, and John. And they went and told others. And they told others. Then there were 70 disciples. And the gospel began to spread around the entire globe. And how many of you know it's still to be that way today? We are to take the gospel to our friends and to our neighbors. Go ahead, Steve. Silent night. Come on, everyone. Let's just sing together as one choir. Holy night. All is calm. All is bright. Round young virgin, mother and child. Christ the Savior was born Emmanuel God is with us as we go this Christmas season I want you to know God is with you every one of you God is with you I'm always aware that there are those who are experiencing loneliness or loss maybe you've lost a loved one this year I'm praying God's comfort in your heart maybe maybe there's some problems in the family I'm praying God's comfort and God's reconciliation God is with you. And God is going to be with you as we conclude this Christmas season, as we go into the new year. Come on, everybody. Do you recognize that today? And it's all because of Jesus Christ that we can give Him praise. And we can go through this season with great confidence and know that God loves us. Amen. How many of you are ready to surrender to God and give Him your heart? Father, we praise you and thank you. Jesus, thank you for your willingness to come. You surrendered to God's will. You said in that garden, Father, not my will, but thine be done. Lord, may that be our heart today and throughout this season and throughout the rest of this year and as we began the new year, Father, give us a heart that says, Yes, Lord, we surrender to you in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. God bless all of you. I'm going to ask something deeply spiritual of you. When you blow your candle out, please put your hand over it. We have the fire marshal back here who's got his fire extinguisher. And so let's be real careful. That's deeply spiritual. I know it is. And someone in just a moment is going to turn the lights on. But let's all blow our candles out now. God bless all of you. Amen. Merry Christmas, everybody. Let me just say before we go today, if you need prayer or encouragement, my wife and I are going to be here. We, we, we're going to hang around a few moments. Uh, if you don't know God, you want to talk about your relationship with Him, we'll be here. There will probably be others here 
at the front of the church and we'd be glad to talk with you. Folks, listen, everybody listen now. Next Sunday, I'm starting a new a message or I'm preaching a message entitled Fresh Start. Now this is not going to be a one a message you probably heard before. Is everybody, I hope everybody's listening. This is not about New Year's resolutions. I'm going to tell you how to get a fresh start. If this has been a bad year, you, you, you things hadn't gone well, I'm going to tell you how to get a fresh start. And I guarantee it will work. And so I'm encouraging everybody, let's don't let the, the holiday hangovers get us. Let's get in church and let's get moving in this New Year's. Amen? God bless. Merry Christmas, everybody.